Hi, everyone. For those of you just entering the webinar, I'm going to wait about 30 seconds to allow other folks to join, and then we will proceed with the program. People are still filing into the Zoom room. It's like making popcorn in a microwave. You kind of wait for the pops to slow down a little bit. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arkan Fung, and I am the Winthrop Laughlin McCormick Professor, Professor of Citizenship and Self-Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I want to start with just a few announcements on behalf of the Ash Center. We would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served at a site, as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Today's event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center's YouTube channel shortly after this event concludes. You're welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of this event. Please send them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of uh, submitting them via the chat. That way we'll be able to kind of get through and process them a little bit uh, more easily. Also, for those of you interested in uh, other bold ideas to deepen democracy, check out tomorrow's Ash Center discussion at 4 p.m. on non-citizen voting, in which we'll discuss how cities like San Francisco, New York, and Boston have or are seeking to expand the franchise to folks who aren't U.S. citizens. Uh, I will put a registration uh, link right now in the chat for people who are interested in that. So the one of the main goals of the democracy program here at the Ash Center is to explore changes that can improve some fundamental problems with American democracy. A lot of people think that polarization and the two party system is or has become a fundamental problem with our democracy that is exacerbating conflict, that is artificially constraining voter choice. Uh, and you know, historically, the United States, if you look before the early part of the 20th century, uh, had uh, oftentimes more than two parties. And so some people think that uh, in economic terms right now, what we're operating in is a two-party duopoly where the two parties have kind of done stuff to freeze a lot of uh, other would-be third, fourth, fifth parties out. And so we are interested today in discussing uh, ways of moving beyond the two-party system, proportional representation, ranked choice voting, a number of other um, uh, possibilities. And uh, we have three excellent speakers here today to explore this topic. Rob Ritchie has been the leader of Fair Vote since co-founding the organization in 1992. He was named its president and CEO in 2018 and has led Fair Vote Action since 2002. He's been involved in helping to develop, win, and implement ranked choice voting, PR, electoral college for, uh, reform, AVR in lots of places all around the country. Rebecca Chavez Hook is formerly uh, formerly represented Salt Lake City's 24th district in the Utah House of Representatives from 2008 to 18. She focused there primarily on public policy related to health and human services, as well as voter engagement and access. She now provides coaching, leadership, and community engagement, uh, and through her consulting and public affairs practice, Aspira Public Affairs LLC. And uh, my good friend and colleague, Danielle Allen, is the James Bryant Conant Prof uh, University Professor at Harvard University and Director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. Uh, Dr. Uh, Danielle is a political theorist who has pushed broadly and uh, published broadly in democratic theory, political sociology, the history of pol public thought on many, many, many issues. Um, okay, so uh, how this will go is uh, we'll have a few rounds of back and forth of questions for uh, Danielle, Rob, and Rebecca. And then we will open it up to audience questions uh, at around 440. So we'll have 20 minutes, uh, leave ample time for questions. And a lot of questions have come in through the registration already and please, ask questions through the Q&A function. Um, okay, so first question is for Danielle. 
uh, Danielle, if some kind of proportional representation in US elections is the solution, what is the problem in American democracy that you hope that these reforms might address? Well, thank you so much, Arkan, and to all of your colleagues for pulling this important conversation together. It's great to be here with Rebecca and Rob. We are becoming definitely sort of fellows in arms here in the campaign for healthy democracy, and I'm grateful to have the chance to have this conversation. Um, I always like to start by saying, you know, wow, you know, that, that's a big question. And we have to say out loud first that there's not a single answer, right? Because there are just so many elections in this country. It's sort of the beauty of democracy is that the goal is to give people voice and choice. And so we give people voice and choice for president, for Congress, for the Senate, for our local state legislatures, for school committees, for city council and the like. And so a healthy democracy really is about, can we get voice and choice for all? We've never actually had that fully healthy democracy in this country. So we have a kind of 21st century goal. Let's get it done, finally, voice and choice for all. And so the question is, where do we really see failures of that kind? And I'm gonna just focus on Congress for the moment, congressional districts. We all know that our congressional districts have gotten less and less competitive and the new rounds of redistricting have got us at sort of over 90% uh, non-competitive districts. And we also know that often um, people can you know, sort of win with just small pluralities um, of the electorate voting for them in the primary and then on their way to the general. And then we also know that at this point, the majority of Americans are not enrolled in a political party. And so to have our politics dominated by parties means, gosh, a whole heck of a lot of people are locked out of voice and choice, um, ultimately, especially since the primaries are so important. So it's against that backdrop of all these different factors that are really reducing voice and choice that proportional representation is a solution um, because it opens up the space for more players, um, more parties to participate, but also candidates from more backgrounds, diversity of demographic backgrounds, ideological backgrounds to participate. And then voters have more choice. Their choices become meaningful. So I know we're going to dig into detail in terms of how we can get that with some really important ideas, the Fair Representation Act that I think Rob will talk about in ranked choice voting. But the core problem that proportional representation is meant to address is that we are freezing people out of voice and choice. And it's time to unfreeze that and PR could help us do that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and then I'm putting a report from uh, the Center for Politics to, uh, at the University of Virginia that uh, if people wanna dig in in a little bit more detail on Danielle's point about how congressional districts have gotten a lot, lot less competitive over in recent decades. And the vast majority of us live in districts that aren't party competitive. Um, so so uh, Rob, just to pick up on where Danielle uh, left off, there are many ways to advance proportional representation in the US. What's your version? What's the version that you favor how would your preferred version of PR work and how do we get there is, uh, and if you could talk a little bit about the Fair Representation Act, that would be great. Great, well, and I echo Danielle and appreciation for everyone pulling this together and to share the uh, platform with all of you. Um, and it looks like almost 200 people onto it, that's exciting. So, um, you know, I've done this for a while, and I will say I started with a general commitment to the goal of replacing winner-take-all elections with proportional representation, had become aware of what other countries do, and other countries do a whole range of things, right? So there's a lot of mixes. I think they're all worthy of, uh, they have pros and cons, and there's no perfection out there. I think as I worked on this and come to appreciate what it means to make change in the United States and what fits who we are, we have settled on a particular approach, and that is the idea sort of grounded in our own history. It's, it's been used in a lot of cities in the United States, and it's used in, in a number of other um, countries that are familiar to people, what Ireland has, what Scottish elections next month are going to do at the local level, and so on. It's the idea of the single transferable vote or ranked choice voting within uh, relatively modest multi-member districts, three, four, five seats. So it's a, it's a proportional system based on, on voting for individual candidates. Um, and some reasons why it, it fits well with the United States, it, the same system can be used in nonpartisan elections. It's actually used right there in Cambridge and it's used uh, you know, in, in, in some other uh, cities as a voting rights remedy. 
It, uh, the same voting ballot can be used for an executive election. So that's the ranked choice system that's now used in more than 50 cities and, and two states for their presidential congressional elections. So you can have like a consistent way of voting, a consistent way of creating positive incentives, we believe, for how uh, candidates and, and voters can interact and what the voters can do, which is really a similar process to say, hey, who's my favorite, who's my second choice, and who's my third choice? When you apply that to congressional elections in the Fair Representation Act, which is entirely constitutional, um, this is a statutory decision. Why we have single member districts is actually a product of a 1967 law that mandated a certain approach across the country and designed to have a relatively fair process across the country. And I think it's deeply unfair all across the country. And, and so this is a fair representation approach, which would establish a relatively comparable system across states and have really a remarkable effect. And we will get into that effect, but I think for, for why it also fits this country is it, it really deeply and profoundly and effectively addresses questions of minority voting rights in the South and in other places where that's been a challenge within winner take all elections. Again, because the individual voter can vote for candidates of choice within within a um, within a proportional system, it also has that direct relationship of candidate and a voter that is valuable. And because we have a lot of states that are pretty small, you know, half of our states are five seats or fewer. So that's a relatively high threshold of votes that it has to take to win. If it's five seats, you know, a party with ten percent is not going to win any seats. And, and so a, a ranked choice system always means that those votes get to count for a backup choice and it kind of builds that into it. So it really addresses kind of the, the, the split vote problem and it allows more nuance and, and difference within the major parties, which is very consistent with our political history, right? So we, we don't have a history of sort of homogeneous parties that act just all with one and the party tells them what to do. We're seeing more of that, but I think that's actually not a very healthy way for our political system to work. And, this form of, of proportional voting in the Fair Representation Act would allow that politics to kind of foster that kind of politics. Great, thank you very much. Um, the third question is for Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, when you were in government in Salt Lake City, you championed ranked choice voting. What drew you to this kind of obscure policy and what did you say to people to explain to them why they should care and support, you know, this, this kind of procedural change. Like I, people oftentimes gravitate toward the substantive issues, like the one you've been, the ones you've been working on on health and human services, on environment, on infrastructure, on safety, on healthcare, but why this kind of how people vote? Well, Arshan, thank you for the question. Um, actually, the idea came to me from a constituent as legislation often does. Uh, and it came to me quite a long time ago uh, when I was just starting in the legislature back in 2008, when I first got elected, I had a constituent take me out for coffee and he said, I wanna talk to you about this new form of voting, instant runoff voting. And he explained it to me and I was perplexed and confused. And uh, I said, boy, this is my very first year in office. I don't know whether I can push something like that along. So fast forward, I said, you know, I'll, I'll keep it in my back pocket. And as I started working on other elections reforms, I served on uh, Governor Huntsman's Commission to Strengthen Utah's Democracy in 2009, where we explored uh, options such as um, election day voter registration, portability of voter registration, compliance with MOVE, all of these different things. Um, so I was starting to get involved and very interested in elections reform, but I always kept that in my back pocket. Fast forward to 2016 and what I was seeing as an elected official from my constituents and my voters as they were getting actively involved in presidential campaigns in particular. But what I had also seen just door to door when I was walking and I was knocking and canvassing door to door in my neighborhood with a lot of my constituents who either they may have been registered or they weren't registered to vote. And I was trying to convince them to get registered to vote. And they would say, I don't know, I don't bother. You know why? My vote doesn't count. I don't I just don't bother doing it. My vote doesn't count. So 2016, what I started to see is more and more people that were not interested in affiliating in with a, a partisan party, with a political party. In Utah at that point, and this is still the case, um, we have a second, the second largest voting block in Utah registered voters are unaffiliated voters. Republicans are the largest block and the second largest block of voters are unaffiliated voters. Hmm. So I was seeing this change over time 
And then I reached back into my backpack and I thought, hmm, I'm gonna pull out this instant run of voting concept, bank choice voting concept, and learn a bit more about it because to me, it feels like maybe this is the issue, this is the mechanism by which my constituents can feel that their vote counts. Um, lastly, one thing that I was no noticing in municipal elections, uh, I have a very progressive district, and inevitably you would have three or four or even five candidates for a city council race that are very similar in the way that they approached public policy. And so I would be canvassing for them on their behalf for neighbors with neighbors, and the neighbors were saying, I don't want to have to choose. I like these two people a lot. I like these two people, you know, these three people quite a bit. And I hate having just to pick one. I like this one a little bit better, but I, you know, I'd be good with this other one. So it was just an issue of timing. Sometimes that it's the way it is with policy windows. As we know, it's the right place, the right time, the perfect storm to roll something like this out. And so that's what I did in 27 and 2017. We ran some legislation to um, try to do ranked choice voting. That's great. Thank you very much. And uh, I just want to kind of draw a line under something that Rob and Danielle and Rebecca have all emphasized, which is that um, one of the things that ranked choice voting and different kinds of PR would enable is for voters who now feel like they don't really have choices that they're really excited about to participate and give them real reasons. And one of the, if you do opinion surveys, right? I mean, the unaffiliated is the second largest block. That's an amazing figure. If you do public opinion surveys, large majorities of Americans would like to see more than just two parties. And part of the effect is like, you know, if Rebecca is running on the ballot in the Green Party um, and I vote for the Green Party, my vote, I feel like rightly that under our current rules, my vote is just going to be wasted because Rebecca doesn't really have a shot. But if I get to vote for Rebecca as number one, and then Danielle's running for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party as number two, and Rebecca doesn't get enough votes to be up there, then Danielle gets my vote and I won't have wasted my vote. And that is a really fund fundamental difference from the individual's perspective as a voter, but it would have large changes to the system as well. Um, so, um, that's really important. Didn't want to lose. I like the idea of being your backup choice, Arkan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a couple of years ago, this one's for Danielle. Um, you chaired uh, a very important uh, committee of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that issued a great report, Our Common Purpose, that is still having lots of ramifications and people are doing all kinds of things with different recommendations in that report. One of the re recommendations is to quote, amend or repeal and replace the 1967 law that Rob mentioned that mandates single member districts for the house so that states have the options to use multi-member districts on the condition that they adopt non-winner take all models. Now, did some people in the commission, I don't want you to violate any confidences, but I wanna know a little bit more about what the debate was. Like were some people worried that that was too radical, too much of a departure or was it a, like a quick consensus? Yes, we should definitely do that. And how did, what were the debates on either side and how did people kind of come along to eventually favor this recommendation? Well, Arkham, I will say one of the things we did on the commission was constantly quote Benjamin Franklin to ourselves. <laughs> um, Franklin at the very end of the constitutional convention, um, at the very end when everybody had to come and actually vote, he sort of stood up and said, whatever arguments we may have had, we're going to bury them here and we're going to sail forth, you know, with unanimous view on behalf of this constitution. It's not perfect, but I can't imagine a better. Um, and so off they went and they buried their arguments and the like. So I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of answering your question, the terms you asked, but I can certainly share that, um, you know, this, the 1967 law um, was, of course, aimed at preventing um, another type of gerrymandering that would have eradicated the power of the Black vote in the South. So the concern, the reason multi-member districts uh, were banned was because the fear was um, in white majority districts, what that would mean would be the sort of full dilution of African-American voting power. You'd have three members of Congress for a single district and the majority could elect all of them. The white majority would have complete power. So it's back to that point that Rebecca made so powerfully, right? When the, the problem is that some people feel that their votes don't count. 
And for African-Americans, obviously historically, that has been a huge issue over time. And the civil rights movement has fought so hard um, to overcome that. We continue to fight to overcome that. Um, and so that's why, as we worked on this question of how to make sure we could get voice and choice for everybody, it was just critical to glue together the multi-member district idea with the ranked choice voting idea. You needed that connection to turn it into a proportional representation measure and to ensure that what it would do would be to give voice and choice to all, to make sure again that minority communities within a district would have a shot um, at getting their candidates elected. Um, so voice and choice, so that was sort of the key concept and the worry was always, you know, is this gonna be a mechanism that degrades voice and choice or one that improves voice and choice? And so, you know, we believe that that combo, again, the Fair Representation Act, multi-member districts plus ranked choice voting for those members um, improves voice and choice for all. Great, thank you very much. And I do want to single out and return, I, I'm sure we will return to this theme of how we run elections and the importance of minority representation and historically in the United States, of course, a representation of African-American voters in the South. And um, one of my favorite articles on this is from uh, the late Lonnie Guineer, who I'll, I'll post the article in the chat, Second Proms and Second Primaries. And she's arguing against the main way that we assure minority representation in uh, the United States, which is, to, is through single member districts that will guarantee at least some that uh, African-Americans, other, other minority groups have some legislative representation. And hers was an argument against this way of doing it for all sorts of reasons, but one that it, it kind of bakes these preferences into the electoral system. And her analogy that she, uh, uh, talking about voting rules was to uh, a high school prom in the South in which the African-American students and the white students couldn't agree to the same playlist. And so they decided to have two separate proms. And she said, that's terrible. That's not what, you know, that's not what we want. And so her idea was cumulative voting in which each of the students would get like 10 votes and they could stack them on whatever songs they wanted. And the top getting songs would be on the playlist. So that was kind of her suggestion about how to um, not kind of gerrymander to ensure or have separate proms to ensure representation, but through uh, much better voting rules. Um, so uh, next question is to Rob. Rob, you've been doing this a long time where this means working for proportional representation reforms. Do you feel like where we are now in 2002 is a better, easier moment to talk about this and move it forward or a harder moment? Because I could imagine it being a harder moment because a lot of people are worried about the January 6th problem, about the survival of democracy itself. And they're thinking, well, let's just fight to keep what we've got. But then I could also imagine that people might be well, democracy is on people's minds more than it has been for a long time. So they might be open to considering other kinds of ways, more deeper ways to make it better. So is this a harder time or easier time for this debate in your experience? I would say it is a profoundly um, important time. And, and I think <laughs> that has led to a great deal of of increase, more resources, more allies. And I think I have always felt this was profoundly important, which is why I started working on this a long time ago. Um, I would say the um, case for it, the arguments for it have, have just brought more, more people in in some way, you know, the Our Common Purpose Report is just one extremely important reflection of that. Um, and I think what we haven't really said is, I think directly as we could, is that the the way that the two parties interact, the, the, the way they, been driven into camps that are increasingly uh, at war with one another, and the fear and 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 um, and bitterness that really exists between the parties that drives a sort of zero sum calculations to governance has gotten very bad, right? And I think we all see that, and um, and a lot of people are being hurt in that, and a lot of people can be it could get a lot worse, and I think there 
you know, it, at the end of the day, that's a reflection of winner take all, right? It's 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 right in it's right what we're seeing, right? And and so one thing just to be clear about what the Fair Representation Act would do, and again, this isn't the only way to do proportional voting, but it's the proposal that's in Congress that we think is is particularly right for the United States. If we would apply that, so this is districts three, four, five seats. It takes about fifteen to twenty five percent of the vote to win. You apply that across the country. There's pretty much every single corner of the country, every corner in any state that has at least three representatives in it, you would see representatives of more than one party being elected, right? So you would be, you would have a, a cracking up of, of winner take all. You would, you would no longer have red and blue fiercely different. You would have shared representation across the country. On racial grounds, you would go across the whole Black Belt of the South, across all of Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, all of California, you would have more than one racial group with the voting power to help elect candidates of choice, shared representation again. And you think about the challenges we face and the value of having people represented together, that has always been important. I think now it's becoming an imperative and that if we don't address that, it's just gonna get very much worse. Now that creates greater tension around this. It creates a feeling of maybe winners and losers, but at the end of the day, the winners are all of us. And I think that's the case that proportional voting depends upon. At the end of the day, we all get to win and we all get to win our fair share, right? And 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 isn't that nice? And that, <laughs> that's sort of what, what maybe America should be about. And so I think um, we're certainly seeing even down at the local level as well, uh, practical applications of ranked choice voting are taking off. Rebecca's home state tells us that big time. And, you know, uh, Republicans are using ranked choice voting in two congressional nominations in Virginia. And, you know, it's just something that I think can can make sense in a variety of settings. That's great. So um, to Rebecca, just kind of taking off from what Rob said, uh, this is a question about who you found actually favors the proposal. So I mean, one of the features of American politics is that different groups and different parties don't seem to agree on very much these days. So in your work on ranked choice, uh, other strategies toward PR, did Republicans and Democrats seem to favor the proposal any more or less than each other? You've done a lot of work with Hispanic communities in Utah. How did the folks you talked to in those communities relate to RCV, uh, any different from white communities? Like what are, are there any noticeable kind of differences of politics between groups and how they react to this kind of idea? Well, in terms of Utah, when we first started rolling this out a few years ago, um, we're a bit of a unicorn because the Republican party early in the 2000s had been utilizing instant runoff voting internally for their party elections for party officers. So folks that were really kind of entrenched the base of the Republican Party, some that have been um, involved for a number of years, were familiar with, with using the, the methodology in their own party elections. Um, our, the, I, I don't want to ever take credit for all of this because my Republican colleague, uh, Representative Mark Roberts, was he is an ambassador, an apostle. He is a, a totally devoted to instant runoff voting as the way to go. And he was trying to get legislation passed when he first came into the legislature um, in uh, the 2010s uh, to see if we could implement instant runoff voting because they'd had experience within the Republican party of moving away from plurality candidates. And so he had been really pressuring that to happen. And so kind of, again, this perfect storm happened in wow. 2017 after the 2016 presidential election where I saw that he had been working on this. You have Republicans that were very familiar, especially those that were in the state legislature and that were actively involved in the party. I actually had a bit of a tough time with my own Democrats trying to explain it to them because it was a very novel um, novel methodology for us Democrats in Utah. And we're such a super minority that folks were like going, oh my gosh, why would you just mess with anything? It's bad enough as it is. But it, over time, what we were seeing is a lot of our younger voters within the progressive arm of, um, of, of, of the Democratic Party, they were totally bought on to this. They wanted to try something new. Um, so they have started to really push our Democratic Party and our Democratic leaders into uh, supporting ranked choice voting. And then that's how we were able to get it um, through the legislative sessions uh, in 2018 for our municipal pilot. 
the other thing about the municipal pilot being nonpartisan, I think it was also easier to convince legislators to implement the pilot as a municipal pilot because there was nothing having to do much with the partisan, uh, the nature of elections with, with our municipal pilot. And, um, and so it, it was a good place to start. It was a really good place to start. Now, in terms of educating and informing the voters, we're still, the jury's a bit out on that. We've had some really great success with our municipal pilot. Last year, we had 23 cities that opted to try ranked choice voting. 20 of those cities actually had ranked choice voting elections. And um, the, the, we did some uh, scientific polling with voters and exit polling uh, and had some really great, great numbers to share with, with folks at the end of the day. Um, what, where I have some concerns, and I think that, uh, that Rob really uh, teed this up well, is what we're seeing politically and ideologically related to elections in general, issues with stop the steal, the secure the vote folks, the folks that are you know, leaning more extreme right to the, on the political spectrum, have really raised concerns on all forms of election processes that seem to expand voter access. And um, so my, my fear and our concern has been is how do we hold the line? We've made such great accomplishments and great advancements in implementing the, the municipal pilot here in Utah. Uh, but we've got folks on the edges that are starting to mess with, let's get rid, by, rid of vote by mail, let's get rid mm -hmm. of anything but a paper ballot at your local precinct. Um, and let's, you know, get rid of ranked choice voting. So we're trying to hold the line and gain some more successes and get more people exposed to experiencing the municipal pilot mm. um, in that regard. And then briefly, if I can address the, the Latino community, I want to lift up uh, Democracy Rising, did some wonderful focus groups, both in Las Cruces, New Mexico, as well as here in Salt Lake City. And within the Latino community that they were polling with in those focus groups, I'll just share one quote that was shared by one of those participants who said, I use this method to be a mom. I use it to make decisions by preference. That way, if something doesn't work out, I have a plan B in space, in place. So people get it. They get it and all these arguments about you have to do a lot to educate voters. It's just not true. It doesn't bear out. That's in, on the municipal elections. That's, that's so interesting. So I, wanted, I wonder if Danielle or Rob have thoughts about the, the voter confusion and education worry about some of these changes that people won't, you know, in Rebecca's terms, that they won't get it. it it's like, kind of hard and confusing, especially because it's new. Do What do we know about the extent to which that's true? Either Danielle or Ron? Well, I'll, I'll just share my, you know, deep experience in tracking and following these elections closely. New York City rolled out ranked choice voting for uh, presidential, not presidential, and uh, uh, their mayoral and city council primaries last summer. And um, Surge in turnout uh, over the last open mayoral race, about 25% more people voted, second highest number of mayoral voters in city history, very diverse city, 90% of people ranked first time out, uh, out of every 300 voters, only a single one made an error that counted, uh, that, that made their ballot not count, so people uh, used their rankings effectively. And, you know, something like 75, 80 percent said they 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 found it easy and liked it better more than their old system. So I I think that was a test because it's such a such a diverse city. Now, that's on the, the filling the ballot part out. The thing I think we all need to work on, and it really is most important when it's first used, is like results are going to look different. Right. And, and outcomes are going to look different and people need to feel confident in that. And I think that is where voter education is very important. And it's very important to work with the candidates and the media and everyone to sort of be clear about that. Um, Rebecca was part of efforts to do that there in Salt Lake and, and, and in Utah. And I think um, we now have, I think, a roadmap. We're going to see Alaska rolling out ranked choice voting for the first time this summer. And I think we are seeing more and more, you know, first uses going well. Oh, that's great. So I want to just actually pick up a theme coming up in the chat that relates to this question, the good theme in the chat of, you know, are ranked choice voting and proportional voting the same? No, is the answer to that. And we have sort of just lumped them in together in this conversation. Somebody pointed out, if it's ranked choice voting used in a single seat election, it is not proportional. 
it becomes proportional when you have multiple seats and you're using ranked choice voting because the first seat gets one and then all those votes pop out of the pool and then you've got the second seat to allocate and your remainders in the minority are the votes that determine that second seat. So that's how you get a proportional effect when you've got multi-members um, and ranked choice voting working together. But the reason I'm calling that out is just because it speaks again. I mean, I, I don't think education um, around any given voting method is necessarily hard. You have to do the work. It's just that every single voting method is a technology. And so I like to say to people, yeah, like, you know, I have to learn how to use my new phone too, right? And it feels great when I had to switch from a Blackberry to an iPhone, that was hard. That was really hard, <laughs> switching from one technology platform to another. And it's the same degree of difficulty switching from one voting mechanism to another voting mechanism. Yeah, you got to learn it, but everybody can learn it. Yeah, there are early adopters. And the odds are, if you don't put effort into helping everybody transition, those early adopters will be the people with means who, like all technologies, adopt faster and sooner than others. So it really is important that when we think about transitioning voting technologies or voting platforms, um, we invest in that implementation so that we're bringing everybody along for the transition at the same time. And as Rob and Rebecca have said, there are really terrific organizations working on this. I'm glad you called out Democracy Rising. They're doing great work. And so we know it's doable, um, but we do have to do it. And by the same token, I think also when we have our broader conversations, um, you know, I, I want to really encourage everybody to sort of ask questions that are place specific. Um, the voting rules in every single state are completely different from every other state. And so it's like really hard, but we like actually can't have a kind of just cookie cutter conversation. We've got to say, OK, in Massachusetts, how do we get voice and choice for everybody in Massachusetts? Like, what's the list A through Z on that one? And then in Utah, what do we need A through Z? And the lists are not going to be exactly the same. So my dream, okay, like if I could wave a magic wand, we'd have a conversation where we'd have the folks from Massachusetts stand up and say, here's the top five things we need. And the folks from Utah stand up and say, here's the top five things we need. And the folks from New Mexico and so forth. Then we'd really be having a democracy conversation. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and it is important to recognize, I mean, part of the point of having a bunch of these conversations is so people can wrap their mind around these different technologies, as you as you put it, right? Super important. Um, and you know, one of the place-based features that Rebecca raised, which I had no awareness of until you raised it five minutes ago, is that one, one reason that the Republicans in Utah supported the reforms is because they were comfortable with it because they were using it inside the party, which is like a very context-specific thing, right? <laughs> right? So. Um, this kind of raises a question for uh, anybody on the panel, and it came up in uh, some of the Q&A that people raised before, is given that incumbents, politicians in office are understandably reluctant and resist kind of any sort of rule changes because they did pretty well under the set of rules that, they, that got them there, what sort of arguments and what sort of politician and what sort of politicians kind of are drawn to things like uh, multi-member district PR or uh, rank choice voting in your experience in Massachusetts or Rob in Congress or other places? Yeah. Yeah, Rob, go ahead. Well, maybe I'll start people like Rebecca, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think, you know, what we have found is that there are, thoughtful people um, across the spectrum who are ready to, to think um, about their role seriously and, and um, be open to big ideas and new ideas. And, um, you know, Rebecca worked with, with Mark Roberts and a very, very different uh, uh, person on the spectrum um, in politics. And yet they both really came together and, 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 and advanced this in, um, you know, I, I, I think, there is a sense that politicians will never change rules that that elected them, and but in fact they often have, right? <laughs> you know, like so. My my wife Cynthia uh, runs Represent Women, which is trying to to get women up to parity, and you know the 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 goal there is is a is a is a hard one, but it also is one that's making advances, and it's one that actually a, a proportional system is really enhanced. But women didn't even have the vote, right? And then men voted to allow women to vote, right? So, so, so that was. But it took a lot of work. It took a lot of activism. It'll talk. It wasn't just men activating. It was women activating. But at the end of the day, 
you know, the electorate almost doubled at once. And, and, and that was just one example of, of, of a big change, but we've seen a lot of changes. The Senate, you know, changed. So it had to be elected, right? Um, that was a constitutional change. And then there's, there, there's lots of things different. So, so what has to happen is, is a lot of, there has to be a problem identified, which, you know, Danielle lifted up a problem. The reports lifted up problems. We're all experiencing problems. And then there have to be people that are ready to unite with those outside there are people on the inside ready to unite with those on the outside to say it is time for a change we have a problem we all must deal with and i think that's the decade we're in this is a decade where we have to big, have big conversations and i think there there's a lot of allies that we're seeing coming to the table that weren't there before good good yeah and if i could add it's just you know people have to focus on what the what the end game is and that is expanded voter access and people like we said, like Daniel said very poignantly at the beginning that all voters count and about voters feel should, all voters should feel that their vote counts. And uh, it is difficult sometimes, well, oftentimes with incumbents because they have gotten used to running the show the way they do it. They're very familiar with how campaigns run. And when, as we've been implementing, you can tell the ones that are been around for a while because they're the ones that are pushing back a bit because it's like, okay, wait, now, now what am I gonna have to do when I'm campaigning? New folks, folks that are jumping in and, and filing to run for the first time, they're very excited about it because they haven't had, you know, they haven't run in the old format. So they're not stuck in that, 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 that cycle of, this is the only way we can do it. And this is what I'm familiar with. And so the biggest challenge I have to say is oftentimes with incumbents because they are used to doing things in a certain way, but the, the, the constituents are the ones that have the power. And the more that we saw that with our city council races in particular in Salt Lake City, where you had constituents that were talking to their city council members and saying, I want this option, please vote yes on the ordinance to implement ranked choice voting. And more and more constituents saying, please give us this option. That is what was the most, I think probably the most compelling arguments for some of these communities is the constituency. So it's everybody that's listening here is yeah. weighing in with their, with their elected officials and saying, we want to change. And you're the ones that have the authority to do it. We expect you to do it. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Danielle, do you have thoughts about, um, what the important ways to move forward are? Do you feel like in a lot of places, you know, it, it, it would your priority be kind of getting more local experiments and state experiments or is Congress with all of its uncompetitive house races, the priority, is it kind of moving forward as quickly as we can to um, get uh, PR or RCV in as many places as possible, or is it more about the education and building popular understanding for it? So, I mean, this is just the hardest question. Everybody <laughs> is struggling with this, and I'm going to give you an answer, which I'm sure not people won't all agree with, um, but it's just, you know, what I've come to. I do think that right now we should all consolidate around getting RCV, ranked choice voting, in as many places as we possibly can. That's a very specific answer. <laughs> as many elections, inside parties, also huh. in our formal elections. The reason for this is because it's, it's doable, it's in stream, there's momentum, it's building, the education is proceeding. New York just taught the whole country what it is and how it works. And then if we can actually do that, it teaches people we can change things. And then we can ask the question, okay, well, what can we change next? So I, I, I implore everybody on this call, have a list of five things you want to do. Five, but put RCV first. I don't <laughs> care what you put second, third, fourth, fifth, okay? But it is time for us to consolidate and converge around a first choice. So we can get this done together across all jurisdictions, across all contexts. Oh, that's so interesting. Very, very specific. What, Rob and Rebecca, what do you think? I mean... Do you agree? Do you have like other priorities that you'd want to put in there? What do you think? That no, was great. And, That's yeah, great. it was. And just to, to, to dovetail into what Danielle just brought up, you know, I'm encouraging like student body councils. I mean, anybody, anytime anybody clubs, social clubs, groups, whenever they do a vote and they send me these surveys, I'm like, why are you only giving me one choice? <laughs> you know, it's like, let's start moving into this place like Daniel, so where you normalize ranking your choices, regardless of what the election or survey or whatever it is, 
let's start normalizing it and using it with frequency so that when we do change it in regards to um, public policy or elected officials elections, it's normalized and it's by practice and, and people are used to it. So, yeah. And I, I just to echo that, Rebecca, it's sort of exciting to see we're up to, I think, right almost at 100 colleges and universities around the country, all around the country, a whole mix of places. Harvard, you know, does it, but so does, I don't know, small colleges. Idaho, Boise State, whatever. I was there Boise this State. week. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, there we go. Just, just you know, LA, uh, Louisiana State University just passed a referendum to use the proportional form of ranked choice voting and, and ranked choice voting for student government. And um, so that, <laughs> that's this organic movement that shows how young people really are appreciative of having greater choice in this ballot type. And I think the goal of voting equals ranking is powerful. It's not proportional representation, as Danielle very rightly said. It is a piece of the puzzle that we believe is part of proportional voting as it's best, most likely to be won in the United States. Um, and can be part of some of those wins as, as it is in some of the cities that are using it. We have a belief we can get to 500 cities using ranked choice voting, which would be tenfold from what it is now, but just within a, a few years, we can see a number of presidential primaries using ranked choice voting. Um, we can have some presidential elections using ranked choice voting. We have two that already are, but we can, we, we can, we can keep, keep going from there. And there is this important conversation as we engage mm -hmm. with our deteriorating politics, and the interseen warfare and the potential inability to govern that we may see in 2023, depending on what happens in the, in the fall elections, we have to start having a hard conversation about what we need to do about that. And it's not a simple answer. And that's where I think you begin to realize we have to have this big conversation. And that's, that's gonna take a little more time, but it doesn't have to take an endless amount of time. Yeah, that's fascinating. So I'm just paraphrasing, Danielle, I just found your answer so striking that it, it, um, in its kind of clarity and, and focus. And I, I think my interpretation is part of taking off what you said before, all of these things are technologies, including ranked choice voting. It's a technology that can be deployed in you know, faculty senates or in student government elections or in political primaries or, you know, just like anything you might want to take a collective decision on or a vote on, you can use this. So let's start using it and, uh, more than not, not start because it is, but expand it out, get a lot of people comfortable with it. So it's not this like scary thing. And then uh, that will form the foundation. And that's your education, right? Is like, you know, as John Stuart Mill said, schools of democracy. Here's like a little way to create a bunch of schools of democracy around how to vote, right? Which is like super, super interesting. Really good. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, do we have any evidence either uh, in the municipal elections at the state level that uh, either proportional representation in the US, well, we don't really have multi-member anything. So it's a little hard to say. We'd have to look to other countries. But ranked choice voting, do we have any evidence that it moderates as opposed to just continues or exacerbates the polarization that we're seeing? I think, you know, that that's a problem that a lot of people are worried about. People are drawn to alternative voting rules because they think we'll get more moderation. Do we, do we have reason to think that, that it will actually have that effect? Why don't I share a couple of things? I'd love to hear what Rebecca and Danielle have to say, but I think the, um, here, look, just go to quantify one number. So we've looked at, um, we've got a lot of jurisdictions, hundreds and hundreds of ranked choice voting elections now have full data sets of, of the rankings. And you can start seeing what makes you a successful candidate in a ranked choice voting election, particularly these are mostly nonpartisan and primary elections, but it's making connections with people that you get ranked, right? So, so you are seeing winners typically get ranked in the top three by 65, 70, 75% of voters. And these are races that they might only win 53 to 47 or something in the final round, but a lot of the people who finished second, you know, those backers of that candidate also rank them. And that's an intentional, a product of intentionality of engagement. So it's 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 inclusiveness, not necessarily kind of like centrism, but it but it but it's learning how to speak to different people and learning how to earn to 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 earn their respect. Mm. I think a, a ranking is an expression of respect, and a and and a ranking of something you've said makes me think that you're you're okay, and 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 that's an attitude that re, that that's a reward. 
I, I will say for multi-member districts, we in fact see a lot of multi-member districts at the local level. Uh, we still have a number of states that have multi-member districts. I here in Maryland have three uh, local house members in, in my state legislature. They're almost all winner take all. So you don't get the, the same dynamics, but you, you do see um, one history. I'll just sort of briefly say that Illinois had three member districts with a system of cumulative voting, the one you mentioned from uh, Professor Guinier. And um, that's a proportional system. It, if you talk to anyone who is still around, who knows how uh, Illinois was when they still had cumulative voting, which was through 1980, they will say that that legislature was a very different place. And it's because both parties represented every part of the state. They worked together in the, the Springfield in a different kind of way. Their caucuses had the whole state in the room when they went off in their corners. And it just did promote a, a different kind of politics. And, and that's a measurable, distinct, you know, um, the different place. Now we need more more places to do it to have more models, but um, there, there's good evidence that it would work that way for other elections too. That's good, that's good. Um, there is a, this, this question is I think first for Danielle and then for Rebecca, great question from Ken White in the Q&A. How did running for office inform the views of Professor Allen and Representative Chavez Hook on this topic? So I think hopefully a lot of people in the call know, but Danielle uh, ran for governor uh, up until a couple of months ago. So did it affect your views on this topic and how? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was already in favor of ranked choice voting beforehand. Um, but it certainly clarified for me the value of it. Um, in Massachusetts, we have the 50th most restrictive ballot access procedures in the country for statewide office. And that is because it requires a caucus system to get on the ballot where candidates are actually competing with each other to get on the ballot. And we use a winner take all method even inside the caucuses. So it's not even Iowa caucuses, which are proportional um, and is really designed to limit, you know, the number of people can get, can get onto the ballot. So that's interesting, right? Because it's an example of a very specific, very technical place where you might think of using ranked choice voting or yes. you might not use caucuses at all for ballot access, but at any rate, that's another matter. Um, so the point is just that, yes, um, it, you know, I found more places where ranked choice voting would make a difference, but I also more broadly sort of saw the real problems with voice and choice unenrolled voters in Massachusetts really don't have a chance to weigh in in our elections. So that has led me to kind of focus my attention on what are the kind of key changes we need to achieve that. And I do think ranked choice, ranked choice voting is the sort of switch we can flip most easily to start a kind of cascade of changes through the whole system. That's great. Yeah, Thank I you think very the much. One, I yeah. think the one thing that I would add is in Utah, we have a caucus convention system by which people are placed on the ballot. And those are the parties that determine that um, within the last well, it's almost been a decade, we did finally provide an option for people to get on the ballot by signature petitions. They get a certain number of signatures they can get on the ballot for a party. But previous to that, it was just caucus conventions. And when you have so many people that are unaffiliated, um, the Democratic Party does allow individuals to not be affiliated with the Democratic Party to participate in their caucus convention system, but the Republicans do not. Theirs is a closed process. So if you were a, a conservative leaning, leaning person that wanted to stay unaffiliated, as Daniel mentioned, no choice. They, I mean, they just, they weren't involved in selecting the candidates. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that as more and more people are not affiliating with party, they believe in issues, they support policy, um, they want representation that listens to the way they want to, they want their, their government to be administered and run, uh, that, you'll, that you'll see more folks kind of leaning to these new methodologies of electing uh, people. Um, the, the parties just really are struggling with, with, with retaining uh, participation. And I think that we just need to look at more ways where people feel that their voice counts. That's great. Thank you very much. So. I want to, uh, we have uh, time for a couple more rounds um, from the, uh, I'm deriving or combining a couple questions uh, from the chat. Uh, so I wanted to explore a little bit the proportional representation branch rather than the ranked choice branch. So um, as we've uh, kind of explored a little bit, ranked choice is a train that is a little bit out of the station. There's cities, there's like places, you know, you can look at it, you can kick the tires a little bit 
and you know as daniel said it would be great to see like lots more of it like let's get familiar with this multi-member districts and proportionality much less so so um where are are there in the united states and at, at what level kind of green shoots for thinking about moving that forward the multi the proportionality portion and the multi-member district portion or is that just kind of um further off and we're kind of starting from um no real empirical starts there well first you know if we uh look across the waters or around the world, right? There's a huge uh, amount of yeah. use of proportional representation, including most uh, well-established democracies, right? So, so there's a lot of, lot of empirical evidence to look at here. Of course, that's not within the United States. There is a lot of actually uses of alternatives to winner-take-all. So you think of winner-take-all, meaning 51% of voters control 100% of representation. Let's say all Connecticut cities, uh, if they have an at-large election like Hartford, um, they can't be winner take all, right? There's nine seats and voters have six votes, which isn't, which isn't enough to elect all nine seats. Philadelphia, seven seats at large, you only have five votes. So you see these kind of like a lot of different sort of that kind of like cracks of, of winner take yes. all. Um, there are uh, just a lot of at, at large elections where, or multi-member districts. And you know sometimes that can be a, a tool of minority vote dilution, but sometimes when it's also a, and openness to where voters can 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 uh, can show their differences and not not just vote for, for 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 a single dimension of what matters to them. So there is some evidence there, and one could go into great deal of detail about that. Um, I think the um, you know the the, the ranked choice proportional system, which is the most finely tuned proportional system of these candidate based systems, does have a few uses. It, it's used it's used in Cambridge. It was used in East Point, Michigan as a voting rights remedy in, in the last, last couple cycles. It's gonna be used in Albany, California, almost certainly as a voting rights remedy. It has some really fascinating history. Earlier, New York City back in the, the World War II era had, had a proportional system when LaGuardia was mayor. Um, and uh, so there's things to learn about both the political trajectory of those systems and, and their impact, but a consistent impact was kind of an expansion of a full a, a fuller representation of of what that jurisdiction is and that would include people of color in new york city that's how adam clayton powell first got elected uh, um, uh as the first african-american on the city council and ended up going on to congress and so on but it is it has it, it wasn't a, a a gateway for new voices and new perspectives kind of as a consistent um uh finding any any other thoughts on um, on the proportion of the, the multi member proportionality issue? I think that's a that's a tougher one, but you got to start somewhere. So yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I can I'll just reiterate slightly. I mean, I do think um, I I'm really focused on the question of um, what it takes for us to adopt new technologies, um, and so in that regard. You know, I think the combination of multi-member and ranked choice voting is a good thing to be aiming for. Um, but I think it's also reasonable that we are actually sort of sequencing how the elements of the technology are brought in. That's what I was yeah. really trying to communicate before as well, right? right? right that right. if we can get ranked choice voting anchored, then that opens up the space to start pushing forward towards the multi-member ranked choice voting approach. Yeah. Great, good, good. And um, to the question in the chat, and uh, Rob made this point, um, or a version of this point, so for people wondering about how common two party systems are in the world, not very common at all. Among mature democracies, it's the United States and Hungary and everybody else has more than two effective parties, right? And so we are a, quite an outlier on that dimension. And so I think that's like, you know, not dispositive, but for some reason, to think that, well, you know, kind of updating our electoral system might include more than just the capital R Republicans and the capital E Democrats. All right, last last lightning round for uh, everybody. One piece of advice or what would you ask people in the audience to do or what would you advise them to do to either learn more and explore more about this idea or if they're already in favor of it to try to move it forward? What can folks in the in the chat do, or in the Zoom do? Anybody? I 
I guess one thing that I would bring up is don't don't get stuck on one uh, format. I think Danielle has brought that up many times during the last hour, um, because our, the way we run our elections in states and municipalities and you know, local elections, special districts, uh, they they vary. Um, so uh, you know, just get started. Uh, that's the one thing that I love about the fact that most of the pieces of legislation, whether it was election day voter registration or vote by mail here in Utah, and now municipal RCV were all pilots. And that gives you an opportunity, try to do um, either trigger laws that allow you to do it as a municipality if your state then permits it, becomes permissive, but try it out as a pilot because then you learn. You learn and then you can adjust and uh, you know, make those revisions in terms of how those elections are administered going forward, but you're not gonna know until you try. And so um, let's just get started and, um, and, and try to do it within the, the formulary of your own localities, your own state, your own flavor of how you do elections. Um, but, but don't get too stuck of, we've got to do it the Utah way, or we've got to do it the California way, or we've got to do it the main way. Um, there, there's different ways based on what your community's desires and needs are and how your, your policies function. Great. Wow. And, I'll be, and I'll be brief just because I, I loved what Danielle lifted up. So, you know, hey, have five things you work on, but have ranked just voting. Be <laughs> and, um, and and I think it is a lit and is the applications are broad, right? The, uh, you know, Rebecca mentioned many that you can, but there, but, but you're part of organizations, associations, your family, can you go to rankit.vote and set up a vote on something fun and get it, get it started tonight. You know, like, like that's, there, there are ways to make voting equals ranking. If you want to get involved, there's a lot of ways to plug in a lot more groups, a lot of people in states, um, a lot of national organizations from different perspectives. If you go to fairvote.org, we try to be a portal into how you can find uh, others to work with and, of course, work with us um, and get some conversations going on campus. Love this opportunity to work with you, Archon, and we need to do this in across the country in different speakers and different settings and you know, lift up the conversation. So that that's something that uh, those with uh, chances to do that on campus, we'd love to partner with you on that too. Great, and Danielle. And I'm, I'm just gonna part. double click on Rob's comments. Go to <laughs> fairvote.com, get involved <laughs> and find your state linked organizations and yeah. work at the state level. So those two things together, that's In my place. double click. Good, good. And I think one meta theme to go out on for, for people uh, on this panel has just been just such a rich discussion and such knowledge and expertise. And we're at this moment now to second Rebecca, where, you know, we ought to be thinking about lots of new ways to do democracy better, to include more people, to have more choice, um, to govern ourselves in a more equal and full way and don't get fixed on any one. Start, as Danielle said, start with ranked choice voting, but it's a technology and there are many of them, but we don't want to get stuck on this old technology that we've had for 230 years, right? You know, lots of stuff has happened since then. So let's explore new things. Let's do that together to create a better democracy together. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Rebecca, Rob, and Danielle. Big hand, really great conversation. Thank you, Archon. Great to see Thanks. everybody. Thanks for the great comments in the chat as well. Super yeah. lively. Really appreciate uh, I, that. I just tried to grab the chat because it looked like it's so much to try.